At ease, at ease, take your seats. All present, Sergeant? Yes, sir, all present. Let's get going on our subject for this evening, the battle formations of the platoon. Since you are non-commissioned officers, and a platoon is normally commanded by an officer, some of you may wonder why we are tackling the platoon, what concern it is of yours. There are three reasons. First, your squad is part of the platoon team. And if you're going to play effectively on that team, you've got to know how the team functions. Second, we Americans always do a better job if we know the why of that job. Therefore, I want you to learn all the answers before we get into a scrap, because there's no time for explanations on the battlefield. Third, many of you are going to be commanding platoons before this fight is over. Some of you will command companies. A few may even command battalions. Therefore, I want every non-com in this outfit to know everything there is to know about the platoon. I want every one of you to be able to step into your platoon leader's shoes if the need arises. What's more, your platoon leaders and I will see that you have plenty of practical experience in this before we tangle with A. Hitler's goose steppers, Mussolini's invincible lions, and Mr. Hirohito's sons of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to study the battle formations of the platoon in much the same way that we studied those of the squad. We're going to stress why and when these various formations are used. In considering the formations of the platoon, we must bear in mind that the formation adopted in any given situation must solve or help to solve three basic problems that always confront the platoon leader. These are one, security. Two, Maintenance of direction and control. Three, minimum vulnerability to hostile fire. Each of these problems varies according to the situation in which the platoon finds itself. For example, an interior platoon may only have to provide protection to the front, arrange for sight contact with the units on its right and left, and provide the usual anti-aircraft lookouts. A platoon on an exposed flank will have to supplement these measures by a strong flank patrol. A platoon carrying out a job away from its company will have to go the whole hog and protect itself to front, flanks, and rear. The problem of maintaining direction and control also affects the formation of the platoon. Often it conflicts with our other problem, minimum vulnerability to hostile fire. For example, the platoon column is the easiest of all platoon formations to control. But on open terrain, or under threat of air attack, the platoon leader may have to abandon the easily controlled platoon column in favor of a more dispersed formation, such as this in order to reduce his vulnerability. The matter of reducing our vulnerability to hostile fire is largely a question of not being seen. If the enemy can't see us, he can't hit us. Take a look from the enemy's point of view at this ground represented on the sand table. Sight along this terrain and what do you see? Nothing. Now take a look from the top side and you can see why. The platoon leader has adopted a formation to take advantage of the cover and concealment afforded. If he had ordered his squads to deploy into squad wedges, we might have had this. Watch. You can see from this one small illustration how the formation adopted by the platoon leader 
may conceal or help to conceal his unit from hostile observation and therefore protect it from hostile fire. And also, how an ill-considered formation may expose a unit to hostile observation and invite fire. Remember the lesson. A unit seen is a unit fired on. Fix these three factors in your mind. Remember, a good platoon leader always considers them before prescribing a formation. You must learn to do the same thing. For as I said before, someday many of you will find yourselves leading a platoon in battle. Now is the time to learn how. It's too late to learn when the fate of some 50 men is suddenly placed in your hands.